Thanks so much, Dennis, and thanks so much for coming tonight. Uh, so my talk today is going to be about second metabolism in marine cyanobacteria. Um, my, my work is on a little bit uh, larger global scale, but I'm going to try to focus it down as much as possible on the cyanobacteria in the Indian River Lagoon and in southern Florida. And I think most of us are pretty familiar with blue-green algae or cyanobacteria here in Florida. Uh, especially seasonal, seasonal over summertime, they usually form uh, pretty big blooms in the ponds, lakes, rivers, uh, in the lagoon, um, and in the ocean. So here are some examples of these blooms that we usually see here in the lagoon. Um, these are traditionally referred to as blue-green algae, uh, but these are actually bacteria. So they are prokaryotes, which makes them different from eukaryotic algaes, that they lack a, a cell nucleus. And so there are bacteria that form these uh, relatively large uh, colonies, um, often algae-looking colonies. And there are many different types. Uh, many of them form uh, colonies that are, are filamentous, hair-like types. And you also have unicellular types, uh, more phytoplankton type. Uh, so these are bacteria. So here we can see a, a transect of one of these filaments. We can see the cell in the middle. And they are covered by these uh, sheets that they um, uh, protect them, uh, mainly composed of polysaccharides. And, and then they form these long filaments, which are basically colonies where each of these coin-like thing here is uh, individual cells that are stacked together. Uh, so they really are uh, bacteria, prokaryotes. Uh, they differ from most uh, from other uh, bacteria in the way that they are photosynthetic. Uh, so they are photosynthetic organisms. And uh, cyanobacteria uh, are responsible for about 20 to 30 percent of the uh, photosynthetic productivity on the planet. So they, they add a lot to the oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, they're estimated to be over three billion years old. Uh, so they're probably the oldest photosynthetic organism on the planet. So the, the atmosphere that we have today is most likely a result of early cyanobacteria on the planet. Uh, they also according to the endo endosymbiotic theory, um, the chloroplast in, in uh, eukaryotic algae and plant cells where photosynthesis occurs is uh, hypothesized to be cyanobacteria that at some point has been engulfed by plant cells. Um, so cyanobacteria really invented the photosynthesis. And um, um, so I think life on a planet today uh, would be very different without cyanobacteria. They really invented one of the most important biological processes on the planet. And they're also enormously important for global carbon uh, cycling and nitrogen fixation on the planet. Uh, most of us don't think about cyano uh, these uh, things when we think about cyanobacteria. Most of us associate them with their toxicity. Uh, and we see this in most types of environment. Uh, we see an increase of cyanobacteria. Many of them are toxic. And we often see this in aquatic environments, in fresh water and ocean. Um, and this toxicity is due to different organic molecules they produce, different toxins. Um, and these toxins are um, biosynthesized by relatively complex genetic pathways that basically assembles these molecules together. It's like an assembly line of different enzymes to basically put these molecules together to a final product. And these metabolites have a lot of different biological activities um, that are involved in the survival of the organism. Uh, many of these are uh, toxins, so they're involved in chemical defense. Uh, so here, for example, we see on a, this is a pipe on a sandy beach of Curaçao. So we have cyanobacteria growing on this pipe. And you have different herbivores, fish here, sea urchin. So they're usually surrounded by different herbivores that uh, they have to defend themselves against. So they usually produce this uh, compounds as a chemical defense against different herbivores. Uh, they are also under constant competition against other cyanobacteria, uh, other algae. Here's a 
filamentous cyanobacteria growing with a eukaryotic algae. So they are a constant competition for space and resources. And many bacteria also use these molecules for communication. Uh, so these, these molecules can be involved in communication uh, within the cyanobacteria. And these metabolites, um, when we refer to them for uh, something that is a very basic function, we, we refer to these metabolites as primary functions. Uh, these, fu uh, these, these functions here are usually something that adds to the survival of the organism, and then we usually refer to them as secondary metabolites. It's an old definition that we still use. So I usually refer to these metabolites that I talk about today as secondary metabolites. Uh, humans have over time learned to take advantage of these secondary metabolites that nature produces. And when we take advantage of them, we usually refer to them as natural products. Um, and this has mainly been from uh, terrestrial sources, mainly because of availability. Um, so we basically, over time, we, we have access to different plants, terrestrial plants. Uh, sometimes we eat something, uh, sometimes it's bad for us, we die, sometimes it's good for us. So over time, we learn what's good for us. And we learn to take advantage of these different secondary metabolites. And, and here are some natural products that we humans have used for maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of years, uh, and different applications of them. And, and these molecules, these natural products, are today part of the WHO's uh, essential drug list. Uh, most of these, um, if we look at the drugs on the market today, most of the drugs are, uh, come in some way from nature. Uh, so this pie chart here shows the drugs that came out in the last 20 years. Uh, and only uh, the yellow pie chart here uh, in yellow are purely synthetic drugs. The rest of the drugs either comes directly from nature or has been in some way been inspired by nature. So most of the drugs that we, we have at the pharmaceutical uh, stores are in some way comes from nature. Uh, most of these um, natural products, these drugs, as I mentioned before, are from terrestrial sources. And it's mainly because it's been uh, because of uh, availability. Uh, one new frontier that it's um, be, been accessible to us relatively recently is the ocean. Uh, so this is a very untapped source of novel biodiversity that we relatively recently have gotten access to with mainly because of new development as such as scuba diving, etc. We, we actually get a, um, access to this biodiversity. Um, and this started in maybe 50s, 60s, but it started really taking off in late 70s, 80s, uh, exploring the ocean for drug discovery. Uh, but we already have five drugs on the market today that come from marine, uh, marine organisms. And we also have a pipeline. So we have a pipeline that drugs have to go through uh, to get to the market. These clinical trials where they tested different levels. So we have a very promising pipeline of different drugs at various stages of clinical trials. So I think in the near future, we're going to see much more uh, marine-derived drugs on the market. Um, and one very promising source of these uh, potential drugs is marine cyanobacteria. Uh, and it's mainly because of the structure diversity. This produces a lot of very unique uh, uh, different molecules, and many of these molecules are associated with some very, uh, very promising biological activities. And, and here's a snapshot of some of the structure diversity of these marine cyanobacterial uh, secondary metabolites, and you've read different biomedical applications of them. Um, so, at least in my opinion, algae are not bad. Um, but, uh, so th these molecules are, are, they're very important, both from an ecological standpoint and also from a biomedical standpoint. And what are we interested in from an ecological standpoint, the toxicity of them? And we want to be able to know who's producing these toxins. We want to be able to monitor them, uh, to survey these different toxin-producing algae, uh, to predict the production of them or if we're interested in these molecules from a drug discovery point of view. We want to know who's producing a potential drug. We want to have a targeted drug discovery efforts. Uh, knowing the taxonomy of the producing organism, to be able to properly identify it is, is absolutely crucial. That, that's that's what, uh, my, one of my major research interests. Uh, one of the problems with this is that the taxonomic systems of cyanobacteria has in the past been based mainly on morphology. So we've been looking at the appearance of cyanobacteria. And these are, as Dennis said, very small organisms. And 
the classification of them has been based on things like the way they form colonies, uh, they form filaments, if they're unicellular, the shape of the cells, the dimensions, coloration. So there really isn't very many characters we can use. Uh, so it really limits our understanding of biodiversity. And what we're finding now is that more and more of these characters are plastic. So they change depending on the environment. So if we find a cyanobacteria in a certain type of environment, it's going to look very different than if you find it in different uh, environments. Uh, so what we're trying to do at the Smithsonian and, and other people as well is we're trying to do a genetic identification. We're trying to uh, use uh, genetic comparison of the organisms to use that to identify them uh, and catalog them. So basically what we do is we, we take this organism, um, so this is cyanobacteria in the environment, and then we extract the DNA, we extract the genomic DNA of the organism, which is the blueprint of the organism. And then we look for genetic regions in the genomes that uh, encodes very basic functions. Uh, we refer to, to these functions as housekeeping uh, functions and, and the genes as housekeeping genes. And, and the idea here is that they are very basic for the organism. And so they're very concerned functions. And um, it, it, this, this makes them very um, uh, conserved and, and different organisms are going to have these genes. So we can compare different cyanobacteria, we can compare them with other types of bacteria, eukaryotic algae, etc. Uh, and then we, we take these genetic regions and we use a, a reaction, a, a method called polymerase chain reaction. It's basically a genetic copy machine. So we take this genetic region we're interested in and we just copy it into millions of different uh, uh, copies of it. And, and this is a very basic uh, uh, reaction or a very uh, basic approach in its principle. You add an, an enzyme, you use small primocytes to kind of enclose the genetic regions, and then you basically amplify it. Uh, but but it has a, uh, it's had an enormous impact on the field of molecular uh, biology, and, and you got the 1993 uh, Nobel uh, Prize in Chemistry because of this, uh, uh, the importance of this. Uh, but then we get, we sequence these gene regions and then we use these gene regions to compare different organisms. So we basically, uh, we cluster them, we organize different genetically similar organisms into different groups. Uh, and then we use different algorithms to uh, use these genetic similarities to infer evolutionary relationships. Uh, so genetically similar organisms are going to group together. Um, and, then, and then we can, if we know the genetic um, how fast the gene region would evolve with time, for example, we can convert these uh, distances, genetic distances, which is um, shown in the, the length of these branches, we can convert it to, into an evolutionary time, and we can start answering evolutionary questions of this. Um, now, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify a little bit what we're doing here, is that we, we collect this cyanobacteria, um, and, and these are, as, as I mentioned before, they are photosynthetic, so they're depending on, on light from the sun. So they usually grow pretty shallow. Uh, so we collect them mainly by shallow water scuba, uh, snorkeling. Uh, I use a lot of stand-up paddleboarding here in Florida. It's a very easy way to collect them on shallow waters. Um, so we collect this organism, and I've highlighted different morphotypes, different types of cyanobacteria with different uh, uh, characters here, just to show cyanobacteria with different morphologies. And what we do with them is we group them together based on morphological similarities. That's the way the classification has been in the past. And so, for example, we look at basic characters. And I, here I, I use the coloration as a character to identify them. Um, so we organize all the blue uh, cyanobacteria into one group and all the yellow one into one group. Uh, so we call them two different taxa. And then we look at what kind of chemicals they produce. And in the past, we haven't found any real correlation between uh, the different taxa and the type of secondary metabolites they produce. Uh, so then we try to, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use these genetic regions, uh, use them to infer the evolutionary relationship, uh, group them into um, genetic similarities. And then uh, what I'm going to show later is that we're actually finding a very nice correlation between the type of secondary metabolites and the genetic relationships. And from here, then we can look at the type of characters that are taxonomically informative. So we're finding here, for example, is that the coloration isn't a very taxonomically informative, but maybe the shape is, is more informative. So the, the cyanobacteria that I look at, um, look, uh, 
a little bit more exciting. Um, uh, not many people uh, agree with me, but, but I think these are actually very exciting looking <laughs> organisms. Uh, and I know most people only agree with me. But, but here, here's an example of some of the diversity we see in tropical marine environments. Um, and I may work mainly with tropical marine collections. Uh, I do a lot of collections here in Florida. There's a lot of cyanobacteria here, marine um, Florida. But I also do a lot of Caribbean collections. And I also work with different Pacific locations too. So ma mainly tropical marine cyanobacteria. And uh, then we look at the, <coughs> so here is a little bit more complex phylogenetic tree than I showed before. And this is actually very complex because in this tree I've been trying to uh, include uh, the whole phylum of cyanobacteria. And I've, I've tried to include all of these different cyanos as an, as an example. And when you look in this, uh, so I've tried to include as many different groups of cyanobacteria to put them in perspective. Uh, when, you, when you make this phylogenetic tree, it's very important to use, um, to, to use, um, uh, how to say, guide yourself in the phylogenetic space. You need reference specimens. Um, so you always try to include type specimens, which is, which is an example of, of a taxa, um, uh, the genetic read. Uh, so I try to include as many type specimens as possible in this tree uh, for comparison. Uh, the type specimen is usually the original description of the organism. Uh, a lot of times, if, if you don't have access to that, a lot of the original samples are pretty old and not accessible. Then you use reference strain, which is uh, basically a, a new collection from a similar environment of the original samples. So uh, I try to put all of these samples in, in comparison with as many of these reference strains or type strains as possible. And I'm not going to go too much in detail of this, but what we're finding here is that I've highlighted these different samples in gray boxes. And what we found when we look at this is that these, these gray boxes are uh, unrelated to uh, uh, known established groups. So ba basically what, it, what this means is that we have a lot of new biodiversity. We have a lot of new uh, specimens that we don't have any classification system for. Uh, so I, I, I'm just going to start with that. And th th this kind of inspired me, like this new biodiversity inspired me to uh, uh, solve, oh sorry, um, uh, and I'm also interested in what kind of chemicals they produce. I'm, I'm going to go back to that a little bit later. But we're interested in what kind of chemicals this different cyanobacteria produces. And what we do is we, we, we collect this biomass of the samples and we extract them. Uh, we uh, extract them using different uh, organic solvents to uh, um, isolate these organic molecules. Um, it's a little bit like making coffee in the morning. Uh, you grind up the coffee beans and you pour hot water on it and you extract the caffeine, which is your, your natural product in, in the coffee. Uh, sa same principle. You, you take the algae, you pour solvents on it. The solvents are going to extract the, uh, the different organic molecules. And then we use different methods to uh, to, to separate out these different uh, chemical components in, in the extract. Uh, we're using different uh, isolation, purification, isolation methods uh, called chromatography in chemistry. So we get different fractions containing different uh, chemical components. Um, and then we use different analytical methods. We use mainly mass spectrometry, uh, which gives us the molecular weight of a compound and also nuclear magnetic resonance, which gives, gives us structural information of the molecules. And based on these methods, we can piece out, or we can figure out what kind of molecule we produce. Uh, and this um, uh, equipment are both um, here from Harvard Branch, Amy Bright, who's a very good chemist, uh, and she's also a very nice uh, person to let us use this instrument. Um, so th these are both from her lab here at Harvard Branch. Um, we found this new biodiversity looking at samples. And so one of the questions that I wanted to, to, to answer when I started at Smithsonian was, uh, when we look, this is our original when I started, our understanding of who produces what natural products in, in marine cyanobacteria. Uh, so what I wanted to see if, if we apply this phylogenetic method, how well it corresponds with the traditional taxonomy that has been used to identify this. Um, so what I did was I, I tried to gather as many marine natural product producing cyanobacteria as possible. Uh, so we did a lot of uh, gathering literature. Um, 
we went and we collected as many natural product producing cyanobacteria as possible, went in the field, collected them, screened them for different natural products. Uh, we also looked for different cultures to produce natural products and also genetically preserved samples uh, producing different natural products. So we were able to gather the producing strains of 126 different natural products, different second metabolites that are shown to have bi biological activities. And, and this corresponds to about a quarter of all marine natural products. So then we took the uh, producing strains of these natural product producing cyanobacteria and we did genetic analysis of them to, to see um, the, the phylogeny of them. And so here's the phylogenetic tree of these different cyan uh, natural product producing cyanobacteria where I, I've highlighted the groups, so the genetic uh, uh, groups. Uh, we refer to these as clades. Um, so what we found was that we found all this natural product fell into 10 different clades. And I've highlighted these different clades with gray boxes here. Uh, so we found 10 different uh, clades or groups producing these natural products. And this pie chart here uh, shows the distribution of natural products in different, different clades. Uh, so what we found here is that certain clades, certain genetic groups, uh, are much more overrepresented in production of natural products. Um, so for example, uh, these two clades, clade one, clade two, uh, this clade, these two clades represent a, a big portion of natural product. Uh, so th this can be very informative, for example, if you uh, want to go after certain natural product for drug discovery efforts. Uh, so for example, if you want to go, over, uh, go after natural product rich clade, or if you want to look for clades that groups that hasn't been targeted very heavily. So this, this can be very informative in, in a drug discovery sense, in a, um, a drug discovery program. But what, what, what we were interested in is looking at the taxonomy, how they corresponded. And I've highlighted this, the different natural product producing groups in, in uh, blue. Um, so the, the, the blue clades here are different natural product producing clades. And I put the groups that they've been identified as based on traditional morphology in, in green. Um, so green clades here. So what we find here is that there's no correlation between the blue clades and the green clades. Uh, so basically it means that the, the natural product producing strains are, uh, with one exception, uh, found uh, unrelated to the groups they've been identified as. They're also distantly related to any established groups. So in these blue, blue clades, we don't find any closely related um, uh, established groups. So what this means is that we have a lot of new biodiversity and we, um, we, we currently don't have any um, uh, classification system for them. So we don't have any way of properly identify them. So what we have been doing up until now is we've been taking these natural product producer strains and we've been forcing them into classification system based on morphological similarities. Um, so with that, I'm going to focus more on, on Florida uh, with this uh, knowledge about we have a lot of new biodiversity, we lack classification systems. Uh, Florida is a great place. It's nice and sunny, uh, warm. Uh, this, this is something that cyanobacteria like. Uh, so we see a lot of big blooms of cyanobacteria here in Florida, uh, ponds, rivers, uh, in the ocean. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why they're so... Um, uh, th uh, strive, uh, thrive so well here. It's, it's a lot of nutrient output, um, uh, fishing, um, the water temperature is really high, um, uh, they, they might increase with global warming, and we also have a lot of output uh, runoff from, from different canals and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm personally relatively new in Florida, uh, so I'm, I'm not too involved in this. Um, I'm, I'm just an alien, so I try to stay away from too much uh, uh, politics and things like that. Um, but one thing that uh, has been recently pretty alarming is uh, a lot of these runoffs. Uh, there's been a lot of headlights in the news. Uh, freshwater um, unicellular microcystins, which is a freshwater cyanobacteria. This is nothing that I personally wor worked on. Uh, I worked mainly with marine cyanobacteria. Uh, so it's a freshwater cyano um, that has been um, found in, in the river in the, in the ocean recently, uh, producing this uh, microcystins, which is a very potent liver toxins. It accumulates in livers. Uh, it can be 
uh, very harmful. Uh, it's been associated with a lot of fish kill and even human uh, deaths. Um, and we see a lot of these runoffs. This is a recent runoff in St. Lucie River. We see these big uh, runoffs, um, uh, including all of this phytoplankton, microsystem producing phytoplankton. And one thing that I found very alarming with this is a study that some of my colleagues did a couple of years ago where they found that uh, physical stress, uh, this cyanobacteria usually keeps the toxins inside the cells. Uh, certain physical stress, such as salinity, this is normally a, a freshwater cyanobacteria, certain physical stress can um, make them release these toxins. So you have an up to 90% increase of the secretion of toxins uh, as part of the uh, oxidative stress and program cell death. Um, so the question is when we have these runoffs of freshwater cyanos uh, with pretty nasty toxins uh, getting released into the ocean and maybe release these toxins. Uh, I haven't personally studied this, but this is something that I found a little bit alarming. And a lot of people are not very happy about this. Uh, so I've seen a lot of these uh, demonstrations recently. Um, this guy here looks pretty serious. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, something, something that I work more on is, is the marine cyanobacteria, and um, uh, there's quite a lot of them. One group that I worked a lot with is uh, a group called uh, Lingbia, it's a genus Lingbia. Uh, they usually form really big blooms in the summertime. So here's a picture from the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, here's big blooms of uh, Lingbia outside Fort Lauderdale. And here's a picture of a couple of weeks ago, uh, just outside Harbor Branch here on the beach outside here. Uh, so they usually form really big blooms in the summertime. And a lot of them produce different uh, chemicals. Some of them uh, are toxic. Uh, some of them have been associated with toxicity. Uh, one in particular have been associated with uh, tumors in manatees. Um, one of these toxins uh, this is from a couple of years back, a study where they associated a certain lingbia toxin with, with tumors in manatees. What I found a couple of years, I did a study a couple of years ago where I looked at phylogeny of this group, uh, lingbia. And what I found was that this group is, is a very polyphyletic group, which means that it's composed of very, a lot of these genetically distant groups, evolutionally distant groups. Uh, so I've highlighted this evolution distant group in, in uh, this phylogenetic tree with gray boxes here. So what this means is that these are actually evolu distantly related to each other. Uh, and this is something we refer to as a, as a taxonomic garbage bin. We, we basically lump a lot of things that look similar together and we call it the same name. Um, so what I'm really interested in, and here's a couple of different uh, lingbia from, lingbia types from uh, from Florida. They're very common in the, in the River Lagoon and Southern Florida. And they all produce different chemicals, uh, so different chemotypes associated with these different limbia types. Uh, and a lot of these chemicals are associated with different kind of different cytotoxicity, cytotoxicity, toxicity. Um, a lot of them can be a pretty nasty environment, I think. A lot of them also have very, very promising uh, biotechnology, biomedical applications antimicrobial activities, et cetera. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm interested in is, uh, can we distinguish these different chemotypes? So if you see a big bloom outside Hobart Ranch here, for example, can we predict what kind of chemicals it's gonna produce? And can we say, this is gonna be bad, we have to close off the beach, like they have done in Australia here. Uh, so this sign is basically uh, the warning for lingvia blooms. Can we, can, we, can we predict if these are gonna have bad effect on us if we should close off the beach or if there could actually be something good that we should go after and uh, extract for biomedical properties. And the answer to that is right now, no, because we don't have any way of distinguishing these different chemotypes. So that, that's one of the things that I'm trying to work on is to provide classification systems so we can identify these different chemotypes and distinguish them. Um, so what I have done is I've done genetic analysis of these different specimens. And what I found is that this, all these lingbia groups uh, are they're unrelated to each other. And I've highlighted this into blue boxes. So we have at least four different groups. Uh, so what all used to be referred to as lingbia are at least four different uh, groups. And in this 
phonetic tree, I've also highlighted uh, the real lingbia uh, in green here. So what this means is that none of these, in fact, are lingbia. Uh, they look like lingbia. They've been incorrectly uh, called lingbia, but they are uh, di different, different groups. Uh, so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to uh, characterize these different groups, describe them, provide them with names, so we can, we can identify them and, and predict what second metabolites they produce. Um, last year we described, uh, published this group here, uh, Morea, and we used a polyphasic approach to describe these. So we, we tried to uh, describe and characterize them as, as carefully as possible using a phylogenomic approach, which is basically the same as a phylogenetic approach, but we include much bigger data set of different genes, uh, so much more larger scale. And we also looked at uh, genomics, comparative genomics, to look for different functional adoptions on a genetic level to see how they are different from, from Lingby and other groups, etc. And we also used electron microscopy uh, to look for cellular difference on, on a cellular level and also general morphology and ecology as well as chem biochemistry. And the name, we named this group Moria after the uh, after Professor Dick Moore at the University of Hawaii. And he was one of the pioneers in exploring these marine cyanobacteria for the drug discovery pot potential. So we, we thought this was a very appropriate uh, person to name it after. Uh, we're also working on describing the other three groups. Um, one genus, the Prosum hyalidium. And I'm going to talk mainly about Okeania, which is a new genus that got accepted uh, for publication in, uh, two weeks ago. And, and also fourth group, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Uh, it's very common in the Indian River Lagoon. I think most of you have seen it, big floating black mats. It's very common floating around. Uh, we're trying to come up with a name for it, something that describes this floating black mats. Uh, uh, if anyone has any name suggestions, uh, uh, very open for it. Uh, but what I'm going to talk a little bit is this group, Okeania. Um, we named it Okeania after ocean. It's very common in tropical and subtropical oceans uh, worldwide. Um, so it's named after ocean, in Greek. Um, uh, it's related to two other genera. I'm not going to go too much into this, but Trichidespium oscillatoria. Uh, and what we found is that within this, this genus, we found uh, five different subgroups. Um, uh, so I've highlighted this with different colors, these different subgroups. And we also try to include as many different geographic locations. We try to service cyanobacteria from different parts of the Caribbean. Uh, so we went to Curaçao, uh, uh, Panama, uh, Bonaire, Belize, etc. Try to get uh, representative samples of these different species so we can compare them. And what we found is that they actually had very unique growth morphologies. And we use these different growth morphologies to name these different species. Uh, so the first one, Lorea, it forms a very unique um, whip-like growth morphology. Um, and Plumata means uh, feathery pillow. It forms like a pillow-like thing. Uh, Erutoflocculosa is very common here in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, usually forms very big mats outside the Smithsonian on the South Island. Um, uh, which means red tufts in Greek, uh, red, uh, red hair. Uh, hirsuta forms a very shaggy looking hair like things. And comitata, um, uh, which means coming together. We found an epiphytic with another cyanobacteria. Uh, the four top ones are very common in, in southern Florida, um, in the River Lagoon, uh, down in the Keys as well. Uh, comitata I've actually only found in Curaçao, but it's also included in this, in this group. Um, and we also look at most of this um, phonetic trees that I've shown before is based on a certain type of genes, ribosomal genes. Uh, but I always try to use genes under different evolutionary pressures uh, to see that we get the same evolutionary stories looking at different genes. Uh, so here's, here's a gene uh, for an intergenic spacer region, and here's a phonetic tree based on a protein coding genes. But it's basically to see how these different uh, evolutionary stories, how congruent they are the different trees that we get. So this, that tells us the same story. Uh, 
the exciting part here, and I think this is really encouraging with this work, is that when we look at these five different species that we found uh, based on genetics and morphology, is that we found a very nice correlation between the second metabolites they produce and uh, the genetics of them. And uh, so basically the same species always produce the same second metabolites. Uh, and that's independent of the geographic location. So if you collect a cyanobacteria in Florida Keys, and then we go to Belize and collect the same species, or if we go to Bonaire or Panama, they always produce the same second metabolites. So that, that, that's really exciting because this means that we are able to provide classification systems that predicts what kind of second metabolites they produce. Uh, so so we, can, we can identify them and we can predict the production of second metabolites. And that, that, that's really the goal that we're trying to accomplish here, provide these classification systems that allows these predictions. Um, another thing that's very exciting with this is that um, the morphology can be, as I mentioned before, can be very misleading. Genetics is very accurate, but it, it's, it's costly and it's very time consuming. Uh, second metabolite analysis can be done relatively rapid. There are some very rapid and very robust methods that can be done very, che very much cheaper and very, very much more rapid. Uh, so if you can use these, what we find is that these second metabolites are uh, produced very constantly, very reliably. So what we can actually use uh, is use these second metabolites as chemotaxonomic markers. We can use them to identify the cyanobacteria. And that opens up a, a very exciting new potential way of identifying cyanobacteria which I find very exciting. Um, um, and these, these second metabolites can also have a very uh, big influence on the morphology of the cyanobacteria and also in the type of niche, the habitat they can grow. And one example of this is uh, if you compare the species Plumata with the species uh, Hirsuta and Irutiflocculosa. Uh, so the Plumata forms very thin mats, the very four thin mats, while the um, uh, hirsuta and erotifloculosa forms a more hairy, shaggy looking appearance. It's a very different, very different appearance. Uh, if you look at the, the, the surface of these filaments using scanning electron microscopy, we found that the surface of these cyanobacteria are almost completely clean from any kind of biofilm, any kind of a heterotrophic bacteria. While if you look at these, they have very thick biofilm, a lot of bacteria, uh, we found diatoms, uh, different kind of protists. So it's a lot of stuff growing here, right? And this is probably due to the second metabolites they produce. Um, many of these, uh, so this for example resembles uh, quorum, um, homo lactons, which is a second metabolites involved in quorum sensing bacteria. So it's a high likelihood that the cyanobacteria produce these to inhibit quorum sensing in bacteria to inhibit the biofilm formation. And, and that probably influences the morphology and the, the type of, of environment that they grow in. This is um, um, my mom's Christmas present in 2003. Um, uh, her, her name is Bettina. Um, this is taken uh, two days ago. Uh, my brother took it two days ago. Um, she has almost uh, perfect teeth, no cavity. Uh, no plaque, uh, never had any dental cleaning or anything like that. Uh, and that's pretty unusual for a 10 year old dog, I think. Uh, so what, what we do with this, uh, with our dog, is we actually brush her teeth uh, using an extract from a brown algae, uh, Ascophyllum, which is very common in, in uh, Northern Atlantic. And this, uh, this brown algae produces this uh, um, halogenated macroterpene, which is antimicrobial. Um, so, <laughs> I think, I think these, these molecules that cyanobacteria produces, these antimicrobial uh, compounds, has a lot of biotechnology. And, and I mean, this, this extends beyond the toothpaste in dogs. I think there's a lot of <laughs> antimicrobial properties. Is that a phase um, one or a phase two trial? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, good question. I think, I think it's approved in Europe, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's approved in the US. Um, so with that, I just want to summarize that we, what used to be one group here in, in Florida, we used to call them all Lingbia. We divided up into four different, four different genera. So we divided up these groups 
to be able to provide classification systems. So we are able to provide taxa um, with, with chemotypes, so we can, we can uh, identify these different chemotypes. And uh, I just heard from some colleagues, they actually work on a freshwater limpia that's very common in Florida too, that produce a very potent toxin, uh, saxitoxin. Um, so they are proposing that as a separate genus. So we are dividing this, this group up into a lot of different taxa, uh, providing new classification systems for them. Um, so in, in summary, um, cyanobacteria can be, they can be very good. Um, a lot of the second metabolites have very, very good uh, promising biotechnology, biomedical applications, but it can also be very bad, it can be very harmful in the environment. Um, so knowing, be able to have classification systems to identify them and classify them is, is, is uh, very important. And that, that's something we're working on at the Smithsonian to provide these classification systems. And what we find is that um, at least of this chemical, uh, this marine, tropical marine, subtropical marine cyanobacteria, um, uh, there's a lot of new biodiversity that we currently lack classification systems of. So we, we're trying to provide a system so we are able to, um, to identify different chemotypes, uh, to um, monitor uh, toxic algae blooms, to, uh, to, um, um, to uh, predict, uh, predict this harmful algae bloom to, to serve them, and also for the drug discovery efforts. And um, just some, some future directions with this work is that we, we're trying to continue work with these providing classification systems. Um, I, I have a weakness for different chemically rich cyanobacteria, so that's one of my major focus, but we're also trying to provide taxonomic systems for uh, cyanobacteria in general. Uh, we also got a very exciting grant to sequence genomes of uh, different type specimens, so we're working on uh, sequence the genomes of new groups that we are describing uh, to look for new uh, adoptions of these new groups. And we're also interested in going after the pathways, the genes uh, encoding these different toxins, these natural products. Um, and I think this is going to be very important in natural product discoveries, both finding new molecules and also going after the, the genes encoding them. And we also work with new types of identification methods. So the, the correlation we find between the phylogeny and the second metabolites, I think it opens up a lot of new chemotaxonomic approaches. Uh, so we're working with new um, uh, chemical approaches to identify them. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank uh, the Smithsonian where I'm doing a postdoc, especially my advisor, Valerie Paul, um, and all my colleagues at the Smithsonian. Uh, Sarat Gunasekira is a fantastic uh, chemist that I work a lot with. Uh, Sherry Reed at the station is, is, um, has been helping a lot with the collections. Uh, Julie has been helping with a lot of the electron microscopy. Um, uh, and also, yeah, all my, my colleagues and my funding source, the Marine Science Network. And I also want to thank Amy Wright and Priscilla Winder at Harbor Branch for letting me use the equipment uh, and uh, uh, general assistance and help with this. And also Brian Lapointe Point and Dennis for here at Hobb Branch for help with collections and, and uh, general um, uh, advice and help. And, and th thank you all for, for listening today as well. Thank you. Thank you.